It was on the 6th of August, 1945, when the first nuclear weapon used in war was the atomic bomb named Little Boy, which was dropped in Hiroshima. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. Then, in 1952, the first hydrogen bomb, Ivy Mike, was detonated by the United States, which was a thousand times more powerful than atomic bombs. From 1947 to 1960, during the early Cold War, the USSR and the United States were both engaged in a nuclear arms race, so that neither could overthrow the other as a superpower. In total, around 2,000 nuclear tests were conducted by both countries. But there was one country that closely monitored these events, and, surprisingly, developed the same weapon in less time than both the US and the Soviet Union, and shocked the entire world. It was December 28, 1966, when this Asian country successfully conducted its first hydrogen bomb test, just two years and two months after the successful explosion of its first atomic bomb. Because while the United States took seven years and four months from its first atomic bomb test to the successful H-bomb test, while the USSR took three years and 11 months for the same, this country I'm talking about did it in less than three years to develop the hydrogen bomb after its first atomic bomb test, all without foreign help. This country is none other than China. And with this success, became the fastest among the five initial nuclear weapon states, the United States, Russia, the United Kingdom, France, and China, which is also known as the P5. Fast forward to today, China is the world's third largest nuclear power and holds around 500 operational nuclear warheads and is projected to surpass 1,000 by 2030. But how did China manage to get its first nuclear bomb? Before we begin, we want to let you know that YouTube is not a fan of topics related to war and conflict, and it tries to bury these videos in the algorithm. One of our videos even got demonetized. But you can help us out by just clicking on the like button below, which will signal to the algorithm that the viewers are liking the content. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Unlike the USSR or the United States, China was not a superpower at that time. In fact, it wasn't even among the developed countries. Because this is how China looked back then. China is the world's second largest economy and the biggest importer. But 40 years ago, it was a poor, largely rural nation, with at least 30% of its population living in poverty. After a long civil war, the country was in the hands of Mao Zedong, the founder of the Communist Party of China. Mao was a, a hater of capitalist ideology, but his government also failed to execute proper schemes and policies to grow the national economy, which led to a great economic crisis in China. People were starving, and there was no scope for technological development because foreign trade was banned. But the biggest fear for the country was the ongoing race for nuclear power, which created a threat of invasion. And despite so much poverty, with a GDP per capita of less than $100 in the 1950s and 60s, with a poverty rate of 87.5% in 1950, without enough resources and technology, how did China manage to get a nuclear bomb faster than the US and the Soviet Union? The answer to this complicated question is actually a lot simpler, and that is the availability of one of the most critical elements in a nuclear bomb, uranium. In fact, China has over 2.8 million tons of natural uranium resources, which is about 3% of the world's total uranium reserves. At that time, the Soviets were continuously conducting nuclear tests, which required more uranium. And given the history of ties between the two countries and their shared political ideology, it wasn't difficult for both nations to, you know, come together. So, in 1951, China signed a secret agreement with the USSR, allowing the Soviet Union to use its uranium ores in exchange for assistance in nuclear technology. This deal was simple and beneficial for both parties. However, in the late 1950s, Sino-Soviet relations began to deteriorate due to ideological conflicts. Mao was clearly against the Soviet Union's new de-Stalinization policy and its peaceful coexistence with Western countries. Perhaps it hurt Mao's ego? However, whatever the reason, 
He forgot that the Soviets had the upper hand in technology and nuclear power. And so, the Soviet Union withheld plans and data for an atomic bomb, and also withdrew Soviet advisors who were assisting Chinese scientists and research in nuclear development. But before this deterioration, Liu Jie, the minister of the Second Ministry of China, which was responsible for the country's nuclear program, participated in the 1957 agreement negotiation. In this agreement, the Soviets were supposed to provide China with a sample of a boosted nuclear bomb, specifically a quote-unquote layer cake bomb. Because a layer cake bomb refers to a type of nuclear bomb design that the Soviets used in the early stages of their nuclear weapons development. In simple terms, it's a bomb with alternating layers of different materials, typically uranium or plutonium and regular explosives. These layers are arranged in a way that makes the bomb more powerful by boosting the nuclear reaction. The purpose of the design is to increase the energy output of the bomb, making it more efficient and destructive. But very soon, Liu and his team understood that the sample provided by the USSR would be an atomic bomb, not a hydrogen bomb. And both could be very different in principle and structure. And as we saw, the hydrogen bomb was not at all a small thing. It literally had, and still has, the power to wipe out millions in just a few seconds. So, just for context, a hydrogen bomb has the potential to be a thousand times more powerful than an atomic bomb, according to several nuclear experts. So, an estimated 140,000 people died in Hiroshima, and a further 74,000 died in Nagasaki, so you can imagine what havoc a hydrogen bomb can create. And China wanted exactly the same thing, a hydrogen bomb. But if China wanted this nuclear power, their scientists somehow had to crack the code. Chinese researchers used Soviet Union layer cake model to crack hydrogen bomb formula, but soon they concluded that it's technically impossible to use the boosted atomic bomb design to make a hydrogen bomb. And the reason is quite simple. Atomic and hydrogen bombs both work on different principles of physics. So on the 16th of December 1964, China tested its first atomic bomb at the Lapnur site. The fission device, which had a yield of 25 kilotons, was detonated using a shot tower and uranium-235 was employed as the nuclear fuel. So everything's great for China, right? They got their atomic bomb and entered a list of elite countries possessing such powers. Absolutely not. Although the test was successful, Mao was not very happy with his achievement because, as we saw, there was a bigger thing than the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, and he wanted that same thing. And Mao was very desperate to get an H-bomb. Anyhow, by hook or crook. In fact, he even issued an ultimatum to Chinese researchers to find the hydrogen bomb formula as soon as possible. One reason for this urgency was that, following the United States and Russia, the UK had already succeeded, and France was also entering the race, which made the government eager to secure nuclear power. And if you're familiar with Chinese political history, you would know that this was also the era of the Cultural Revolution in China. On one side, Mao's followers, known as the Red Guards, were attacking intellectuals, party officials, and anyone opposed to communist ideology or seen as supporting capitalism. Many universities and CAS institutes were shut down. Research was halted, and science books were burned. Many researchers were redeployed to work on defense projects. In fact, the situation became so much worse that, according to CAS's own records, 229 scientists were either killed or took their own lives during this time. The irony was that Mao's party was punishing scientists for not cracking the hydrogen bomb formula, while at the same time, his own followers were burning study materials. After all these challenges, how can scientists or researchers discover a formula? It was a do-or-die situation for most of these researchers, and if they wanted to survive, they had to find a way to crack the hydrogen bomb code. So, they tried something different. Now, Recently, we crossed a million subscribers. Ever since then, we've been flooded with emails asking us questions and advice about growing a channel here on YouTube. Even though we try our best to reply to every single email, sometimes these take up too much time or they ask the same question we've answered a thousand times before. That's why we've decided to put all of our YouTube advice into one email bootcamp for completely free. So, if you're someone who's interested in starting your own YouTube channel, you can get your email bootcamp by clicking on the link in the description or by scanning the QR code that's on the screen. Okay, now let's get back to the video. 
theoretical division of the Second Ministry decided to form a group to investigate the U.S. and the Soviet Union newspapers and scientific papers on the subject. Due to Mao's strict policies, it was very difficult to find any foreign newspapers in China in those days, and the Beijing Library was the only place where all foreign newspapers were available. However, access to this library was not open to the public. The theoretical division needed special permission from the government. But surprisingly, the government granted the request. Maybe because they were more desperate to uncover this information? After collecting all foreign journals and newspapers from 1945, the team began to read through them. However, they couldn't find anything useful except for one U.S. newspaper, which contained an article about Edward Teller's brilliant idea that led to the creation of the hydrogen bomb. Now, obviously, the article did not reveal the actual details of the idea, but it gave them the path to focus on configurations and calculation methods related to a fusion warhead. However, success was still pretty far off. The deadline set by the government was between 1967 and 1968, which seemed impossible to achieve at the current pace. In September of 1965, scientists Yu Min and over 50 researchers gathered in Shanghai, and the great 100 days battle began to achieve the hydrogen bomb code. A group of mathematicians worked day and night to quickly compile a large-scale computer program to start the optimal design of the three-phase hydrogen aerial bomb. However, due to poor availability of computers at the time, physicists had to verify each calculation by hand to solve the problems in time. For nearly 100 days and nights, all the physicists, mathematicians, and research assistants gathered in Shanghai, arranged shifts, and took turns in the computer room around the clock to solve the problem. Many scientists who were in that group were too young and lacked the basic knowledge of hydrogen bombs and practical experience in scientific research to tackle hydrogen bomb theory. And then one day, a programmer within the group suddenly got the surprising result of a 3 megaton yield. Yu Min and a few other experienced physicists rushed into the room to find out his code. But unfortunately, it was expected to result from a incorrect calculation. Actually, the programmer made a mistake in entering the mass of the thermonuclear fuel into the program. However, this small error helped Yu Min and other physicists understand the actual calculation method of the hydrogen bomb. It reminded the researchers that one of the most important factors in obtaining a high-yield hydrogen bomb is to increase the density of light nuclear materials, and that the design of hydrogen bombs should take the path of high density. Finally, Yu Min understood the principle, and in January of 1966, the researchers returned to Beijing with the new hydrogen bomb formula they had sought so hard for nearly 100 days and nights in Shanghai. And, with approval, bomb production had started. A new two-year plan was proposed for three nuclear tests that aimed for a breakthrough in confirming the H-bomb principle. The boosted atomic bomb 596L was dropped from the aircraft H-6A over the Lapnur test site a former salt lake in northwestern China. The yield of the test bomb was around 220 kilotons. But the second test, conducted in late 1966, was even more challenging. It involved a low-yield hydrogen bomb. And although Yu Min and his team had already figured out the formula, they weren't sure if the test would be successful or not. Through relentless efforts, hundreds of simulated detonation experiments, and continuous research and analysis, the structural configuration of the trigger system was finally solved. In simple terms, a hydrogen bomb works by using two stages to create a much bigger explosion than a regular atomic bomb. The first stage causes a small explosion, which then sets off a much larger explosion in the second stage. The Chinese device was given the code name 629. Unlike American designs, early Chinese hydrogen bombs had two parts. The first part is called the primary, and the second part is called the triggered secondary. On December 28, 1966, under the supervision of Chinese Marshal Ne Rongzhen, the H-bomb, known as 6291, was successfully detonated. The explosion yielded an impressive 122 kilotons, and the device weighed approximately 1,500 kilograms. According to an interview of witnesses, device 629 was placed into a large insulated tank, and its total weight was just over 2 tons. It was a low-yield test device, so most in the West don't consider this date as China's first hydrogen bomb test. However, the Chinese do. 
After this explosion, the programmers decided to apply the same principles and configuration to test the full-yield H-bomb 639, which was set to be detonated on October 1st, 1967. Everything was going according to plan. Then suddenly a speculation hit the office of Deputy Director of the 9th Academy, Peng Huan Hu, got the news from his agents that the French would conduct its first H-bomb test in 1967, a year before the scheduled date. China didn't want to lose this race on the West's hand. So they changed the date to June of 1967 and being ahead of France had become a slogan. The processing and manufacturing of the first device known as 639 was completed. Following the two-year plan, Plant 221 in Qinghai province prepared a total of eight test bombs, which included four counterweights for Air Force airdrop training, two telemetry devices for a comprehensive rehearsal at the test sites, and two hydrogen bombs. Finally, the long-awaited day arrived on the 17th of June, 1967, just two months before France tested its own hydrogen bomb. China successfully conducted the H-bomb air burst test, which was coded Operation 2173. The bomb was dropped from a Hong 6A bomber over the air burst center of the Lop Nur test site base 21. The explosion reached a height of 29.3 meters with Ground Zero located 64.8 meters away from the center of the airburst. It was one of the greatest achievements for China, because its scientists took less than three years to develop the first hydrogen bomb after its first atomic bomb test without foreign help. In contrast, the United States took seven years and four months from its first atomic bomb test to successfully make an H-bomb, while the USSR took three years and 11 months for the same. But at the time, China was trying to achieve nuclear power, and the US and other Western countries came up with an idea of NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, to control more countries coming into the nuclear race and to hopefully lower the misuse of nuclear power. Obviously, if everyone has access to nuclear bombs, then it can take seconds for the world to become a planet of ash. So, on July 1st, 1968, China signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, committing to nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. They agreed to maintain a policy of no first use and support international non-proliferation efforts, including the prohibition and destruction of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. Even on the 24th of September 1996, China signed the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, but has not ratified it. And from the last few years, it's also modernized the field of nuclear power. October 10th, 2021, China released a written statement at the first committee of the 76th session of the UN General Assembly, declaring that China was committed to peaceful development and nuclear strategy of self-defense. But from whom? In January of 2022, the Chinese Director General of the Foreign Ministry's Arms Control Department stated that China was not expanding its nuclear arsenal, but was instead modernizing its nuclear forces. Like, seriously? Because reports suggest that China has 350 intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, 72 submarine-launched ballistic missiles, SLBMs, 20 gravity bombs, 11 to 17 tons of highly enriched uranium, and around 3 tons of weapons-grade plutonium, with which more than 1,500 more warheads can be created. Additionally, according to a Chinese nuclear geology report, 70% of newly discovered uranium resources in the country are fine and extractable, which could significantly increase its nuclear production. And China is also planning to start building a molten salt reactor power station in the Gobi Desert next year, 2025, to advance its nuclear industry. This will be the world's first of its kind since America stopped its molten salt test reactor in 1969. For someone who's not aware of this, this reactor operates without water for cooling, as it utilizes liquid salt and carbon dioxide to transfer heat and generate electricity. Using thorium as its primary fuel means worries over a potential shortage of uranium, the usual fuel used for nuclear reactors, are alleviated, as thorium is more abundant than uranium. And the fact is, thorium does not possess the capability to sustain a nuclear chain reaction on its own and needs thorium-232 bombarded with neutrons to convert into uranium-233, which does not naturally exist. Uranium-233 can subsequently function as a nuclear fuel and has the necessary properties to be used in nuclear weapons. 
This means China is also working on alternatives to increase its nuclear power, and this obviously is not a good sign for the world. Over the last few decades, the total number of nuclear weapons globally saw a steady decline. But now, the number of warheads is on the rise again, with China being a major contributor. In the last 10 years, the number of Chinese warheads has doubled, from 250 to 500, with 100 of those added in just the past year. And it's not just a sign of growing nuclear power, but also a sign of a changing Chinese nuclear policy. The 2022 Department of Defense report assessed that the PLA is implementing a launch on warning or low posture, referring to China's early warning counterstrike. This means Beijing would initiate a counterstrike once a launch warning is received, but before targets actually hit China. This strategy requires some warheads and missiles to be stored together, which has not been a part of China's policy in the past. In 2019, Russia offered assistance to China in developing an early warning system necessary for a low posture. And by 2022, China had already deployed three early warning satellites in orbit to support these low capabilities. The shift towards a low posture represents a significant change in counter strategy and has important implications for Beijing's no first use policy. This approach would mean initiating a Chinese nuclear counterstrike against an opponent before China is actually struck. But this is not the first time China has done something like this. In the mid-1980s, China expanded a series of underground facilities to protect its nuclear weapons from enemy attacks, especially from the US military, who demonstrated its striking abilities during the 1991 Persian Gulf War. The Department of Defense estimates there are thousands of these facilities, and China continues to just build more each year. Another key point in China's nuclear strategy is its no first use policy, which has been in place since it first detonated a nuclear weapon in 1964, as I already mentioned in this video. This NFU pledge commits Beijing to use its nuclear weapons only in response to a nuclear attack by another country. Even the 2006 defense white paper reiterates China's long-standing position that it will not use or threaten to use its nuclear weapons against non-nuclear states or in nuclear weapon-free zones. It also states that China will not engage in an arms race. But it seems that China has changed its own narrative. According to a recent report, China's state council has approved 11 nuclear reactors across five of the provinces in Jiangsu, Shandong, Guangdong, Zhejiang, and Guangxi, with a total investment of 220 billion yuan equaling to $31 billion. Reports also suggest that CNN, China's national nuclear corporation, is going to build the world's first high-temperature gas-cooled reactor to be coupled with a pressurized water reactor, or PWR, in Shandong. And there are many similar projects like this. In fact, China is a global leader in nuclear reactor construction, approving 35 new reactors since 2019. Currently, 56 are in operation, with a total installed capacity of 54.3 gigawatts. A forecast by Power Global Data indicates that China's nuclear power market is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 6% through 2035, highlighting China's increasing presence in the nuclear energy sector. However, while these Chinese plants and reactors are officially designated for civilian use and energy consumption, there are high chances that China may be utilizing nuclear reactor materials for military purposes and stockpile manufacturing under the guise of the energy sector. Like last year, John F. Plum, Assistant Secretary for Defense for Space Policy, claimed that Russia was assisting China in producing highly enriched uranium in new fast breeder reactors. However, Chinese officials state that these reactors are intended for civilian energy use. The Department of Defense, however, has noted that China has described the reactors as a national defense investment project subject to military nuclear considerations. If that is true, then it's not at all good news for world peace, especially in the current scenario, where the world is already witnessing so much violence. But on this geopolitical chessboard, China's position is the most interesting and dangerous for everyone, because China seems more ruthless than any other country in the last few years with its foreign policies. It keeps friends close, but enemies closer. On one side, it is expanding its BRI-like strategy in Europe, Africa, and Latin America, trying to stabilize trade relations with America. But on the other side, China sits with North Korea, 
openly supports Russia, and even gives acceptance to the Taliban government of Afghanistan, and that's the reason China is increasing its nuclear power and modernizing it, so no one can even stand against them. As diplomats often say, in geopolitics, the strongest actor is not necessarily the one who plays by the rules, but the one who rewrites them. 